Hello and welcome to Folklore of the Universe, the podcast that's all about folklore of the universe. I'm your host, Kyle, and welcome to episode two. We did it. It's a real podcast now. That's the rule anyway, I think, is that you need two episodes to become a real legit deal. So here we are. We made it. Also, we're on iTunes now, so I guess I accepted past some bare minimum policy content requirement policy they had. And we're up there, so if that's an easier distribution for you, you can find us there. And if you're coming from iTunes, then welcome and hello there. So again, this is episode two. The first episode was a lot of fun. I also learned a lot of stuff from it on, you know, how to do this. And I've got a much clearer idea now of what I'm doing and how I want to do what I'm doing. So hopefully each episode will be better than the last one. You know, just keep going, going up. Just generally how it goes, isn't it? Because the first episode of a show is pretty shaky, still figuring stuff out, and they get better and better from there. And then they peak and then slide downhill into mediocrity. But uh, that's not till episode three. You know, then episode five is the reboot. So we're still we're still rising up here. Now another thing I decided from last episode is that it was kind of boring just to do two of the same stories from the same place. At least it was for me. I don't know if it was for you. So I've decided that from now on, I'm going to try and do stories from different books, and also ones from different continents. That should make things a bit livelier, a bit more varied, and should make things more interesting for me and hopefully for you too. So to the end, I've got a few stories today. The first one is a Japanese folk story, and I've got two West African folk stories, which are both a bit shorter, so that's why I'm doubling up there. So let's dive in. So the first one is from a collection by Sazunami Iwaya, who he did for um, Japanese folklore what the Brothers Grimm did for German folklore. So he collected a bunch of it together and wrote it down. So let's begin. This first story is called The Tea Kettle of Good Luck. Once upon a time, there was a temple called Morinji in Tatebayashi in the province of Kazuke. The abbot of this temple was very fond of ceremonial tea, so that he took delight in making it every day. One day, he bought a new tea kettle. It was so extraordinarily beautiful and so well-shaped that he was highly pleased with his bargain and felt sure that this was quite the best kettle in the world. One day, he took it out of its usual place and began examining it, turning it round and round. Certainly, this is a fine tea kettle, he said. I must invite some guests shortly to ceremonial tea and astonish them all with it. While he was musing in this way, he began to feel strangely drowsy, and gradually his head dropped onto his desk and he fell into a doze. Then a most extraordinary thing happened. The tea kettle, which he had set upon its box, began stealthily to move of itself. While the priest was still asleep and quite unaware of all of this, suddenly a head came cropping out of it, and a legs and a tail appeared. And then this kettle jumped down from the box and began walking rather clumsily about the room. One of the novices who had been in the next room all this time, thought that he had heard a strange noise from his master's apartment, so he peeped in quietly. Fancy his astonishment at seeing the tea kettle walking about the room on its own feet. Oh horrors, oh horrors, he cried. The tea kettle is bewitched, it is bewitched. What? The tea kettle bewitched? Don't talk nonsense, cried another novice, peering in. But when he looked into the room, his breath too was quite taken away. Upon my word, this is astonishing. The tea kettle has grown some feet and is beginning to walk. Then another exclaims, Look, it is turning towards us. It makes shivers run down my back. It is nothing to be afraid of, said another. I find it rather amusing, but his reverence seems to know nothing of this. Let us wake him and tell him about it. So saying, he went up to the priest and called out, Your reverence, your reverence, an extraordinary thing has happened, something most marvelous. What is all this commotion about? said the priest, waking. No time to ask such questions, cried out the young man. Only look and see. The tea kettle has got some feet and is walking about the room. What tea kettle's feet? Mercy upon us, he cried, rubbing his eyes and looking about. But now behold, the tea kettle was standing on its accustomed box, looking quite as usual. So the priest would not believe what his disciples had told him and said, What are you talking about, you foolish rascals? Isn't the kettle there just where it ought to be? for the novices had not noticed till now that it had returned to its ordinary behavior. "'Most astonishing!' cried they. "'Our lives upon it. It was certainly walking about a minute ago.' "'Well,' replied the priest, "'for all that, here it is on the box now, and you don't suppose I'm going to believe you. 
I have heard of wigs sprouting from a pestle, but a tea kettle with legs, that is something quite unheard of in any land. Confound you both for waking me up from my sound sleep with such prattle. Get out of my sight, you rascals. The novices felt this reproof was rather unjust, and they left the room muttering. But since they were quite satisfied that they had really seen the tea kettle with legs, they could not rest until they could prove to their master that it was bewitched. Now on that very evening it happened that the priest was about to make tea alone. He filled the kettle with water and set it on the fire. Then, as the water grew hotter, suddenly the kettle jumped off the hearth, crying, Too hot! Too hot! How astonished the priest was! Alack! Alack! he cried. The kettle really is bewitched. Oh, come, someone, and catch it for me. There now, exclaimed the disciples as they rushed their master's assistance. They caught it at once, but by this time it was quite an ordinary kettle, without legs or tail. However much they shook it or beat it, there was nothing but the clang of the metal and no sign of magic. What an extraordinary purchase this was, said the priest to himself. I thought I had such a fine new kettle, but now when I use it, it causes such commotion. What shall I do with it? There's no use keeping such a thing. I'll sell it at once. That will be the wisest plan. On the very next day, he sent for a rake peddler and showed him the kettle. The peddler, of course, had not the slightest idea that there was anything at all unusual about it. Why? he asked. Does your reverence wish to sell such a neat little kettle? Isn't it rather a pity? Yes, you are right, it is a pity. But I have bought a better one, so I don't care for this any longer. Very well then, I will take it. So the peddler bought the kettle for four hundred mon and carried it home. The more he examined it, the more beautiful he found it. What a treasure I have got, he thought. But in that night, he went to bed in high spirits. At about midnight, he heard a voice, whose he did not know, calling near his pillow, Mr. Peddler, Mr. Peddler. Wondering what it might be, he roused himself and looked about. What marvel is this? he cried. The kettle I bought today at Moringi is walking about the room with the head and legs and tail. He was almost struck dumb with astonishment. Well, he said, addressing it, are you the kettle I bought today? At this, the kettle came hopping, hopping towards the peddler, crying, Are you frightened, Mr. Peddler? Frightened? Of course, why shouldn't I be frightened? I thought you were an ordinary little kettle. Who would it be horrified to see a tea kettle go walking about with a head and tail and hairy legs? What are you, anyway, a badger or a bear or a fox? The tea kettle chuckled a little and answered, Why, I am called the tea kettle of good luck, but really I am a badger in disguise. Then you aren't a real kettle at all? No, I am not a real one, but I am much nicer than a real one. How is that? Since I bring good luck and am different from all other kettles, you must bear this in mind when you use me and take great care of me. Then you will always be fortunate. But if, like the abbot of Morinji, you should fill me with water and set me into the fire, as he did there, that would be too much. Of course, you are quite right, rejoined the peddler. But if I should leave you in your box, you would be very uncomfortable, and that would never do. What had I better do about it? That is just the point, replied the kettle. If you took too great care of me and shut me up in this box, I should suffocate for lack of air. As I'm alive, unless you often let me out and give me something nice to eat, I should... Yes, that would be hard lines, interrupted the peddler. And so it was that at the temple, I was often very hungry, and used to go creeping about in search of any poor pickings I might find. But at last those novices caught me, and I only just escaped with a beating. And now I suppose it was my fate that made me fall into your hands, so I entrust myself to your kind care. Although I am poor, I am a man and I cannot refuse your request. I will do my best for you, said the peddler. Many thanks for your kindness, replied the kettle. But if I accept it, pray allow me in return to perform tricks for you. Perform tricks, exclaims the astonished old man. You perform tricks? What kind? I can dance, continued the kettle, and perform acrobatic feats. You can dance and perform acrobatic feats? That's splendid. Then I'll give up peddling and start a public show with you as my performer, shall I not? Yes, that's a capital idea. For if I work hard, you will probably make far more money than my peddling. And I, added the peddler, will feed you well, so please do your best. That I will, returned the kettle. So the agreement was made, and they decided to open a show. On the following day, the peddler began making preparations. First of all, he built up a show house. Then he hired musicians, and last of all, he painted a signboard to hang up in front of the house. When all this was done to his satisfaction, he put on his ceremonial dress and was quite ready to perform the duties of a showmaster. At the entrance stood a crier. Here, he shouted, is to be seen an acrobatic tea kettle performing entirely new and original tricks. It is quite different from a dog show or the feats of a titmouse. 
In short, I will show you a kettle with a head, legs, and a tail dancing about. That, I assure you, is something unheard of in the history of the world. You will find it most entertaining. If you hesitate, you may lose a chance in a thousand. You may pay your admission fee after you have seen the performance, but when you have seen it, you will want to tell us wonders far and wide. Walk up, walk up. Within, the peddler opened the performance with these words. I must beg you to excuse me from presuming to speak from the slightly elevated position. I am about to exhibit the performances of a magic tea kettle. First, we will show you a variety of dances, beginning with the rope dance, and then a succession of other wonders. The performer will shortly make his appearance. Immediately, the kettle came out upon the stage, and bowing slightly to the spectators, began a rope dance. At the sight of this astonishing spectacle, so much more wonderful than an ordinary creature on four legs, the spectators were dumbfounded, and one after another were heard cries of, Marvelous! Most amusing! Astonishing! The fame of the exhibition flew far and wide, and everyone wanted to see it. Every day the place was crowded with spectators, so that the building seemed in danger of tumbling down. Indeed, the kettle of good luck had proved itself quite worthy of its name. In twenty days, it had raised a fortune for its owner. Now there was nothing miserly about this peddler, and after a time he began to think it must be rather dull for this performer to be at his tricks day in and day out. So one day he said, Bunbuku, thanks to you I'm possessed of a fortune. I am more grateful than I can say, but I am quite satisfied with what I have. You must be tired of these incessant performances. I have made up my mind to give up the exhibition. What do you think about it? It will be quite agreeable to me if you wish it, replied the tea kettle. Then let me have my wish, said the peddler, and so immediately the exhibition was closed. Not long after this, he took the kettle and went to Morinji and told the priest all its wonderful history. And besides that, he gave it back to him, and with half of his fortune, saying, it is really to you that I owe this good fortune, for you sold me the kettle, and so I have come to thank you. After this, we hear of no more marvels, but the kettle was honored with the name of the tea kettle of good luck, and kept ever after at Morinji as its greatest treasure. The end. Now this is a neat story, because you can definitely feel that it's got a different vibe to it than the Grimm stories we did last week. But at the same time, this story format, where some poor person finds a magical item or a magical animal and it gives them treasure, is a fairly universal story concept. You find that in a lot of places around the world. The thing here is that, for example, in European versions of this, the poor farmer or peasant or whatever typically abuses the power and ends up losing everything. Whereas in this version, as we just saw, that didn't happen. So this is a great example of two different cultures telling the same moral with different ways. So in Europe, the idea is don't be greedy or you'll lose the nice things you have. Or Japan, it's, you know, be humble and don't be miserly and you'll keep the things you have. So sort of like a um, carrot and the stick type dichotomy there. Another interesting thing about the story is the tea kettle itself, this creature, which identifies itself as a badger, but its description lines more up with a Japanese raccoon dog, which is also called a tanuki, which, first off, look at pictures of them because they are absolutely adorable. But secondly, these creatures have always been a prominent figure in Japanese folklore. The tanuki will appear as these spirits who are known for being able to shapeshift, as we saw this one took the form of a tea kettle, and also these uh, mischievous and jolly and also sort of goofy and gullible spirits who will show up and sometimes help people, sometimes cause mischief. Animals appearing as these spirits is something you find in Japanese folklore all over. And also you can find it in many Native American folklores too. Both traditional Japanese belief systems and many Native American belief systems revolved around the world being filled with these nature spirits. So, when supernatural entities show up in these folk stories, they typically appear as natural creatures or animals. Of course, typically it was the cleverer or more interesting animals that got the, got the spotlight. You know, like in North America it was coyote or in raven, in Japan it was the tanuki. Because, of course, no one's going to be interested in the animal spirits of, like, a slug. You know, like, Sammy the Slug shows up and talks about his magic pot of gold or whatever. No one cares about that. But, you know, coyotes and tanukis, they're, they do they do cool stuff, you know? They frolic, they do other things. You know, they're, they're engaging. People like them. 
Now we already covered one moral of the story, but there's there's another one that's much more obvious and I think much more important that we haven't touched on yet, and that's be nice to your kitchen appliances. Because holy shit, like if that stuff breaks and the power goes out and you can't get a new one, like you're just you're just done. You know, game over. Treat your appliances right and you'll be rewarded with all sorts of amazing magical treasure. And also, if you go to make a cup of tea, that you're really feeling tea, and your electric kettle breaks, then, you know, that's not going to happen if you treat them right. Moving on, this next story is a Yoruba one. The Yoruba live in Nigeria and Benin, and the story might be very familiar to probably most of you. This is called The Elephant, the Tortoise, and the Hare. All the animals living in the forest wanted to know who was the fastest, so they picked a day for a foot race, and all the animals in the forest entered the race. At the first trial, it happens that the elephant was the animal that led all the other animals in the race. Then at this stage, Tortoise appeared. He said that he could run faster than all the other animals put together. Then Hare challenged him, saying he could run faster than both Tortoise and Elephant. So another day was named, and on that day the three animals, Elephant, hare, and tortoise were present. Judges were appointed, and marks were made on the ground for the start of the race. When the race started, of course hare ran faster than elephant, and elephant ran a thousand times faster than tortoise. But at the end of the race, it was tortoise who led the other two animals. Everybody was surprised. Tortoise was not. What tortoise did was to gather all his children, and all his brothers, and all his other relatives, and hide them at regular intervals of a mile along the track. He started the race, but it was one of his uncles who finished it. Since all tortoises are very much alike, however, nobody could tell that the one who started the race was not the one who ended it. The end. So I bet right now you're thinking, wow, that's an awful lot like the tortoise and the hare from Aesop, because that's what I was thinking when I first read this. And there are, you know, obviously a lot of similarities, which makes me wonder if these both originated from one common story that sort of spread out, or they arrived independently, which I sort of lean towards the second one because you do see a lot of folk stories popping up in very different places with similar story ideas and similar formats. So I think it's just a part of human nature to come up with these sort of things. More of a universal thing. Now, obviously, there are some major differences in this one. First off, there's the elephant, which I love because I think the world could use some more elephants. You know, we need just more elephants in everything. There's also the narrative difference, whereas in Aesop's story, uh, the tortoise wins just by determination and because the hare is lazy, whereas in this version, the tortoise wins by being clever and outsmarting everyone else. So I guess the moral of the story here is be clever and don't trust tortoises. You know, they're crafty little bastards, and they'll sneak up on you. Like, if you cross them, they'll get you. You know, they don't even have to do anything because they live forever. Like, they're going to outlive your grandkids. They're gonna, you know, leave some really tacky flower arrangements on your grave. Like, the colors aren't gonna go together at all. So don't anger tortoises, and don't trust tortoises either, because they know, th- they know things we don't. But now we're gonna move on to our next and last story of the episode. This is one from Ghana, and it's called, What Spider Learned from Frog. A long time ago, Frog and Spider were the best of friends. They went everywhere together, and they did everything together. All the same... Spider used to treat Frog badly, even though he was his friend. For example, he would always eat most of the fish or meat in their food before serving the meal to Frog. Frog wasn't like that at all. When he shared a meal with Spider, he always gave him a fair share of the meat or any other especially good part. One day, Frog decided he did enough of this sort of treatment, and he thought of a way to teach Spider a lesson. He told his wife to get a meal ready for Spider and himself, and he especially asked her not to put too much salt or pepper in the stew. By evening, Frog's wife had finished everything and set out the food on the table. As they were waiting for Spider, Frog pretended to think of something. He told his wife, Look, I've forgotten my hunting knife. I left it at the farm, and I think I had better go back and get it. If Spider comes, welcome him, and don't wait for me. Serve for the food immediately. When his wife went back to the kitchen, Frog jumped in the stew and hid there. Along came Spider shortly after, and he was given the message and was served the food. The first thing Spider did was to fish out all the meat from the stew and gobble it down greedily. Doing this, he ate Frog too, without even noticing. When he had finished, Spider got up to go, 
and he was just about to take a leave of Frog's wife when he heard Gurdip, Gurdip, in his stomach. He was frightened and began to run, but the faster he ran, the more the noise came from inside his stomach. Greedy, greedy. This went on for 40 days. It kept him awake at night, and he had no sleep and could eat no food. Spider could stand it no longer. He lay down and got ready for death. Then suddenly, Frog jumped out of his mouth and said to Spider, I have known for a long time about your greedy ways, and this should be a lesson you will never forget. From this, you should remember that when you are invited to share food, let the one who provides serve it and divide it among the guests. The End so the nice thing about this one is that it very conveniently summarizes the message at the end for us. So it does quite plainly state that, you know, the moral of this is to treat your guests with the proper respect and customs. There's also the unspoken moral in this, which is don't be a dick to your friends, or they'll make you eat them and get revenge on you. There's also the ever-important lesson of be nice to frogs, which is something I think everyone should remember, because frogs are pretty great. It's probably pretty obvious by now that fr I, I'm, I'm quite a big fan of frogs. And I think that if we all, you know, if we all modeled ourselves to be like frogs a bit more, maybe, maybe the world would be a better place. Or alternatively, you could just turn all matter in the universe into frogs, which, you know, I'm down with that too. Sign me up. Another thing of note in this one is the character of the spider. And the spider is a very common figure in a lot of West African folklore. Like most folklore figures, uh, he can sometimes be the good guy, sometimes be a bad guy, like we saw in this one. And this wasn't really about him in particular, so I'm not going to talk about him too much more, but in a future episode, we will cover a story that focuses on the spider, and we can talk more about him then. But that is all I have for this episode. So, thank you for listening to episode 2. Hopefully I'll come out with another one before too long. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, please uh, share it around with all your friends and family. If you didn't enjoy this, then, you know, maybe leave some feedback so I know what I can improve, because I'm always looking to make this better. Of course, that's to be good feedback, you know, if you just say, like, it's shit, or make your voice more better, then, um, can't really do too much with that. But that is all from me for this week, so... I will see you next time. Bye.